Do you ever wish that you could have a do-over? You could take back what you said, maybe spend money more wisely, call that person before they passed away or before they went out of your life, taking better care of maybe your mental well-being or your health. When I think about regrets, I have several things that come to mind in several situations. And you know what I found that as I get older, it actually gives me more opportunities to focus on and vacillate in some of those regrets because we go, man, I would have maybe done things differently. Sometimes regrets though are catalysts to making life-changing decisions. They can sometimes be something that directs our life in a new positive way. But what I hope for all of us is during this three-week series is it helps prepare us to have less regrets and then deal with the ones that we currently struggle with. And with that in mind, welcome to church. Peace like a river wash over me Immerse me in waters as deep as the sea me in love, healing embrace, peace like a river, and wash over me, as I worship you, majesty.
Welcome, everybody, to our online campus for Pure Heart. We are so glad that you joined us today. Uh, people join us from all around the world, and we are just humbled and honored that you would tune in and want to grow with us. We want to give a big shout out like we do every week to Crossroads Recovery. Guys, we love you. We're so proud of you and proud to be serving and be a part of your life. If Pastor Todd's hanging out with you today, hope you guys are having a great time together. So on Easter, I talked a little bit about regrets, and I had a whole nother sermon series planned coming out of Easter, but today... I want to go in just a different direction. I want to come back to regrets, and I want to talk about that for a little bit because so many people talk to me about the impact that that idea had on their lives. Now, here's what you have to know right up front. It's not, a, it's not possible to get through life without some regrets. We're all human. We all make mistakes. And here's the big thing. We're all still in process. No one is perfect. If you're watching this with somebody right now, just turn to them and smile and go, it's true. You are really, really in process. Just kind of do that. Don't, don't get in a fight about it. Just kind of mention it and smile a little bit. As we dive in, I first of all want to say regrets aren't all bad. Uh, because regrets can actually point us, as Daniel Pink in his great book about regrets talks about, they can point us to what really matters in life. And on Easter, I mentioned uh, four different kind of regrets we all deal with as human beings. Foundation regrets, those early decisions in life that we would have made differently so that life would be going better for us now. Those foundation regrets point us to things that really matter, that build a strong life. Or the second one was boldness regrets. And these point us to like justice issues. Like I should have spoke up about that. I should have wanted to make more of a difference or trust issues with God. I should have had greater faith and trusted God in that area of my life or greater adventure and, and stepped out and done something that would have stretched me in life. The third one is connection regrets. And connection regrets are all about relationships. I wish I would have spent more time with them when they were alive. I wish I would have had more time to hear more of their story. I wish I would have um, made more of a priority relationships earlier in life and developed deeper relationships in my life. And the great thing about uh, connection regrets is they point us to the value 
of people. They wake up our heart to the value of people. And then there's, we talked about moral regrets was the fourth one. And moral regrets, yeah, there's, there's pain that's involved with this and consequence in our life, but moral regrets point us to what matters to the heart of God and ultimately what matters to our own hearts, what matters deeply in our own hearts. So in this series, I'm going to speak to three different stages of life, all right? So come with me for a second. I'm going to speak to three different stages of life. We're going to start with teens and 20s, that, those late teens and 20-year-olds. Um, this is what I'm going to call the foundation years. Uh, also, there's the 30s, and we're going to go all the way to 50s. We're going to call this the building years, all right? And then I'm going to kind of speak to all these age groups throughout the next three weeks. And then there's the, the next is the 60 plus, which is our legacy years. Now, now, real quick, we'll pause on this because these foundational years, these teens to, to 20s, the, the language of those years for me was, I know that. Like, I, I know that. You know, I kept saying that to my parents. I know that. And then when I got in my 30s, 40s, and 50s, and I was building family and building career and building for my future, I realized I don't know that. Like, I really don't know that. I wish I, I wish I knew that. And then the language of legacy years is this. I know that. I just wish somebody would ask me that because I have an answer for that. No one wants to know what I know. And anybody over 60 can relate to that right now. You're going, my kids never ask me. My grandkids never ask me because I know stuff now and no one is asking me. Now, here's what I love about Pure Heart. We are truly a multi-generational church. I asked our administrative department to get on ministry platform that keeps track of all the folks that call Pure Heart home and to look up everybody who is active, an active member or regular attender of our church family. And here's what they found. Listen to this breakdown in percentages of the total, the total congregation, active members and regular attenders. 13% were in their teens. Another 13% were in their 20s. Another 16% were in their 30s, 15% in their 40s, 18% in their 50s, 15% in their 60s, and 10% 70 plus. 57% of our church is under the age of 50. 43% of our church is over the age of 50. That's phenomenal. You don't hear that very much in our world today in church life. Either churches are super young or super old, but to have such a, a blending of the generations is so beautiful. So I wanna talk to these different groups as we go through this series together. And I'm, I also wanna say before I dive into this, I know I'm talking to the online community, but many of you get, have opportunity when you're in Phoenix or those of you who live in, in the Phoenix area, you visit our Glendale campus, or our Peoria campus, I'm really grateful to our legacy members, those over the age of 60, because our music isn't always your style. Uh, my, my dad tells me, my dad has a pacemaker, like the bass impacts my pacemaker sometimes. I'm like, dad, are you gonna be okay? He's like, I'm okay. He says, I, I look over and I watch a whole bunch of young people jumping up and down, worshiping God, and I go, this is good, this is good. And I love that about my dad. So thank you to our legacy members of our family, those of you over 60 who hang out with us, even though the music when you're live on campus isn't what you want, or maybe even when you're watching our online campus, like, ah, oh, this is kinda you know, a little young for me. But you want to be somewhere that's vibrant. You want to be somewhere where the next generation is being reached. And thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being a part of our church family. Now, not only am I going to speak to three different stages of life, I also want to talk about, over the next three weeks, three crucial perspectives in living a life with less regret. There's no such thing as no regret. But living a life of least regret. There's three things I want to talk about. First of all, I want to talk about right reasons. Right reasons is all about motive. I want to talk about right things. That's all about integrity. We're going to talk about that next week. It's going to be so much fun. And then the third week is going to be on right people. And this has to do with growth in our lives. But I want to start this series off today by looking deep inside of our hearts. And I want to talk about right reasons, doing the right things for the right reasons. It's all about motive. Now, the definition of motive is simply this. Motive, the definition of motive is a reason for doing something, especially one that is hidden or not obvious, a desire that causes a person to act. It's a catalyst for change. What's the motive? Motive is everything. Why are you doing what you're doing? Motive matters. The why matters more than the what. The why is actually gonna drive the what in our lives. So, for example, and this is a journey I've been on lately, if, if you wanna lose weight, and to get in shape. We all started off in January pretty strong, right? January 2nd, 3rd or 4th, whatever the day that was, we all started off pretty strong, but it kind of waned. A great trainer, if you go to a trainer, a great trainer will ask you this question, why? Why do you want to get in shape? 
Why do you want to lose weight? Because a great trainer knows the motive matters greatly. If you don't have a strong why, the what will wither over time. If you don't have a strong why, the what is gonna wither over time. You're just gonna give up, and and many of us do. I did for years. Um, Also, if your motive is all about you, um, you alone won't reach the finish line. Uh, You might reach a goal, but your soul won't follow. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You can end up being the most in shape, self-focused, vain, obsessed with you, you, that you know. And and I know this because I've been there. Years ago, uh, in my foundational years, in my early 20s, uh, I opened the first world's gym in Arizona. I know, you're looking at me, you're like, really, you opened the gym? Yes, I did. I was in incredible shape. I had six-pack abs. I was ripped. I was shredded. I'll show you a picture someday. It's pretty interesting, all right? But... I tell you, I was also in love with every shiny surface there was. I I couldn't pass a mirror, a car, catch my reflection. I was consumed with my, I was in incredible shape, but my soul was vain. I was all jacked up because I had the wrong motives. So what I did was I corrected this issue by um, eating lots of peanut butter, gaining 70 pounds, and spending the next 30 years being overweight, which also wasn't really good for my soul either. I had problems on both sides of that, but I've been on this journey that I'm going to talk about at the end of this message today. Now, joy, life, uh, peace, all the things that matter originate deep inside of our soul, and motive is truly a reflection of the health of our soul. What is your motive? Why are you doing what you're doing? And I promise you this, in all three stages of life, Each one of the generations watching us today, those of you in your foundational years, those of you in your building years, you're building family, you're building your career, whatever it is, and those of you in your legacy years, if you will spend some time on a daily basis examining your motives, bringing your heart into the light of Christ and saying, Jesus, Spirit of God, would you please help me understand why I'm doing what I'm doing? Your life will be a light to a dark world. Your life will find more joy, more peace, more strength. I'm not saying it will necessarily be easier because the road I'm talking about is a road least traveled. It's a road most of us don't wanna go go on. And we're gonna look at some key Bible moments today, some key motives of why we do what we do. So let's dive in and see what the Bible has to say about motive. And as I did some studying this past week or so, Um, It's just been fascinating to see how many times the Bible mentions this idea of the motive of our heart, why we do what we do. So I'm going to take a quick dive on this. So first of all, we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 2. The writer of Proverbs says this, People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. See, here's the deal. We have this amazing ability as human beings to justify our actions, to justify our actions. Now, get a little extra raw and real. I spent many, many years serving uh, under a leader who definitely needed to be confronted by some of the behavior in this leader's life, and I never did. As a matter of fact, as a leader myself under this other leader, I lost a lot of respect from some of the people close in my life, and at times even my own wife, because I wouldn't speak up, I wouldn't say anything. But here's what I did over time. I would say things like, no, 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 no. The Bible says to make your leader's job a joy. So I used that verse to justify not being bold enough as a young leader to say, hey, I think this is out of bounds of what God wants us to do. And there was a time during that season the Holy Spirit really spoke to my heart and said, Dan, as a leader, you're being incredibly weak right now. Your motive isn't to make their job a joy. Your your motive isn't to um, honor and respect those who are older than you. You're just afraid to say the truth. You're just being cowardly. You're being passive aggressive. You're You're not leading, and we can justify anything in life. Well, I really love her. I really love him. Well, we're married in our hearts. I know, I'm gonna start meddling now, so I'm just gonna gonna move on. Well, I'm so generous in other ways. I don't need to be generous with my finances. I'm so generous in other ways. We can justify anything and get it out of line with what God's word has to say. We have to be careful. God examines our hearts. He's the one who will tell us, are we in line? Are we out of line? But we gotta submit our hearts to him, all right? So let's let's move on. We're gonna have so much fun with this. Next, Proverbs 20, verse 27. It says, the Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, exposing every hidden 
motive. The idea here is a lamp. The word light here literally means a lantern or a lamp that God literally uses his light, his light to expose the motives of our heart. Side note, have you ever had somebody give you something and you wonder why? Why are they giving this to me? Like, what? what's the whole reason they're giving this to me? Uh, our, our middle son, Luke, uh, he's a great young man. So super proud of him as a dad. Jesus pride with this kid. Um, he's going to Grand Canyon University here in Arizona. And every once in a while, Luke will call me up. He's like, hey, dad, what's going on? I'm like, Luke, what's up, buddy? And he's like, hey, you want to grab some lunch? And I'm like, my 20 year old son wants to have lunch with me. This is gonna be great. And so he shows up at the house, we get ready to go, and it never fails. Somewhere in that lunch, Luke will look at me and goes, Hey, uh, could, I, could, could I get your credit card? I'm a little bit tight financially right now. I, I need to get some gas. And in my mind, I'm wondering to myself, Okay, Luke, did you wanna have lunch with dad? Or did you need gas for your Kia Rio? Which, which was it, okay? I know gas is now like $400 a gallon, but why exactly did you want to hang out? What was your real motive for wanting to spend time with me? Let me shine the lantern of God's light on your heart, and let's find out why you really wanted to hang out with good old dad, all right? Let's keep moving. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10. Jeremiah says that this. this is an intense verse. Um, Jeremiah says, the, heart, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. Now, now pause there for a second. This word deceitful literally means crooked path. That's in the Hebrew, that's what it means, to have a crooked path. It just keeps winding around. It's not, it's not a straight path. It's a crooked path. And unfortunately, too often in our lives, our hearts take us on these winding paths rather than the, the quickest way between two points is the truth if you will, all right? It goes on and it says it's deceitful above all things and it's desperately wicked. Well, that's intense. Th this Hebrew phrase for desperately wicked isn't so much evil. It literally means to be frail, feeble, melancholy, or sick. So it's desperately wicked. It's desperately broken. There's a lot of brokenness in our lives. And we, we, you probably have heard the old term, time heals all wounds but not necessarily. If it's an infection, if time will only bring more infection, time will only bring more pain. If it's cancer, time's not gonna heal that. Time can actually kill you. And so it has to be, that wound has to be cleaned out. That wound has to be healed. That brokenness needs to be put back together and strengthened. And then he goes on, this is just desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And then the Lord says this, but I, the Lord, search all the hearts I search all hearts and examine secret motives. And maybe you've heard the statement before, um, I gotta trust my heart. Let me just be honest, no, not necessarily, because my heart has led me down some crooked paths. My heart has been broken in this broken world. And so there's some areas of my life where I've needed God to do deep healing in my life because my motives weren't right. My motives were being filtered through a broken heart. You know, an, un, an unexamined heart can't be trusted, but a heart that's submitted to Father God, a heart that's asking the Holy Spirit to examine our motives before we act, now that's a heart that can be trusted even more because God promises that he will not only heal us, but he will help us to know what is the actual motive of our heart. And this theme continues all the way into the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, the Apostle Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says this, So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time. Before the Lord returns, he goes on, he says this, For he will bring our darkest secrets to the light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due them. That is so good. We have all kinds of motives, all kinds of reasons for doing things and we gotta be careful judging other people's motives. We need to pay more attention to our own motives rather than what we think other people's motives are because we got our own issues. Sometimes our motive is greed, not generosity. And just because it came to you doesn't mean that it was all for you, right? Sometimes our motive is just comfort. I have a really, really good friend right now who is trying to make a decision, a decision that will actually impact my life and my relationship with him a little bit. It, it may cause some distance, and I don't want there to be distance between us. And you know what? The, the, a couple days ago, I was thinking about this, and I'm like, you know, I really need to challenge my friend to make this decision quickly. 
And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was like, why? Why, why do you want to challenge your friend to make that decision quickly? And here's what I discovered is for my own comfort. I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to wait for the process because the waiting is the hardest part, right? That's what Tom Petty said in an old, old, old song for those of you in your 50s that are watching us today. You know, it's the wait, babe, that's the hardest part. And for me, it's the wait. It's the waiting. What's the decision going to be? And the Holy Spirit just said, do you love your friend enough to let them process with me? Or do you want to do this to speed up the process so that you can know where it's going to land for your own comfort, for your own peace? What's your motive, Dan? Do you love him or do you love yourself more? And I was just like, oh, man, how many times in our life do we make these decisions? Do we do things? Because it's really just about us. It's not about what's best for the other person. Or maybe it's your motive is just fear. You're not speaking up right now at work. You're not speaking up and confronting a person in your life who says they love Jesus and you love them, but there's some broken areas. You're not doing it because you're afraid. What are they going to do? Maybe they won't want to be your friend anymore. Maybe they won't like you anymore. Maybe it's more important for us to be liked you know what I'm saying? Than to really love people. There's, there's so many ways I could go. I could actually spend an entire month teaching on this topic alone. Maybe it's anger and, and really you're just being passive aggressive. And you know, I'm just trying to be kind and trying to be merciful. And you're like, no, there's an edge to what you're saying. And why is it there's an edge to what you're saying? Maybe there's some anger in there and you just haven't been honest about it. You haven't dealt with it. And man, I could go on and on and on. Maybe that's what's impacting your marriage right now. And that's what's impacting your work relationships right now. There's some broken things that in your own soul that you're filtering life through and filtering decisions through. And um, man, I just, I would encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to begin to show you what are your motives. And there, I'm gonna say it again, there's a, a road that's less traveled. And that's the road that leads, Jesus is on. And he invites us to join him into this examined heart life. Because an unexamined heart is a dangerous heart. But it's not easy. Now, next week, we're going to be talking about integrity, and it's going to be real intense. But today, we got to start with motive, you know, because here's the deal. If our motives aren't right, it won't be right. <laughs> I know you're like, oh, that was really deep, Dan. It's true, though, isn't it? If our motive isn't right, it won't be right. In the end, it won't pan out right. It won't pan out right in that relationship, uh, in that adventure that you want to go on. And also, more importantly, won't be right inside because the soul keeps score. And you may justify. We may justify. We may say, no, 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 I'm doing this way. But if it's not right, in the end, it won't be right in here. And Jesus cares about what's going on in here more than anything else in our lives. Let's look at a couple more. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is what Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica. He says this, For we speak as messengers approved by God, to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. So good. We could have spent the whole day on that one right there. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know. Now watch what Paul says to his friends in Thessalonica. He says, and God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. Paul's like, listen, Here's what you got to know. I've examined my heart, and I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that I wasn't pretending. And actually, the Greek word here for pretending means fraud. I wasn't, li I wasn't being a fraud, all right? I wasn't a fraud. I wasn't posing. I wasn't pretending to be your friend just to get your money. My heart was for you, not to get something from you. Man, think about that in your relationships. Is your heart to be a blessing or to be blessed? Are you friends with them because of what they can give you? Right? Or are you friends with them because you love them? And we can examine our hearts all day long in our relationships. Are there certain people you don't hang out with because it's not a benefit? Right? All right, I'm going to move on because it's going to get a little extra intense, all right? One more. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. We'll end with this. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have. So you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Now watch what he says next. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Number one, have you prayed about it? 
But then James says this, and this is so intense. He says, and even when you do ask, you don't get what you, you don't get, you don't get it, sorry, because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. He says, here's the bottom line. For you, it's all about lust. Because every good motive has a shadow side. You know, one of the things that I've had to wrestle out in my own heart is uh, on our campuses and on our online campus, we pray for other church, other churches every single week. We, we love to pray for other churches. So I've really wrestled through on this. And like, okay, keep your motive pure. What is the reason that we're doing this? Are we praying for other churches? Because people go, oh, wow, that pure heart. That Pastor Dan, he's so loving for other people. He really cares about the churches. Or am I praying for other churches because I want to see them grow? and be blessed, and to flourish, and to reach lost and broken people. Do I, am I praying for the churches I want them to succeed, or am I praying for the churches because it makes me look good? That's a slippery slope. And there's times in my life when I catch myself doing things because it looks righteous. It looks good. The heart is deceitfully wicked. It can slip into some wrong places really, really quick. And here's the problem. It might be the right thing, but if done for the wrong reasons, it won't be right. And so I examine my heart and I ask God to keep me on, to keep pure heart on a pure path, a pure motive of why we do what we do. And we have an overarching mission statement as a church that we are becoming like Jesus for the sake of of others. See, here, here, let me just give you a simple way to approach motive. Our motive must always be bigger than us. It's got to be, my motive has to be bigger than me. Matter of fact, my favorite quote from Billy Graham, the, the old Billy Graham, he said this, the smallest package in all the world is a human being all wrapped up in themselves. And the question we ask all the time at Pure Heart is simply this, if we were gone tomorrow, would we be missed? See, here's what I know. It goes all the way back to Abraham's covenant with God. And God said, you are blessed, Abraham, to be a blessing. We, as followers of Jesus, are blessed by God so that we can be a blessing to others. Being blessed is a good thing. There's nothing wrong. You know, Paul wrote to his friends in Philippi. He says, look not only to your own interests. There, we need to take care of ourselves. And it's okay. But look not, but not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. It's, Paul's saying, it's got to be bigger than just you. And so... I used this example in the beginning about losing weight. I have wrestled with my weight since I was born, okay? I've just, I've wrestled with it my whole life. I've had seasons of my life when I've been in great shape. In my foundational years, my late teens and early 20s, uh, I mean, I was in, like I said, I was in great shape, but it was all about me. It was about me looking good. And so I joked about gaining weight, but I did. I, when I, Nicole and I first got married, I gained about 65 pounds, 70 pounds, and I went decades, and I could not lose weight. And for those of you maybe have you know, been around Pure Heart for a while, you've heard me talk about it. I've been very transparent and vulnerable about it. Um, came into the end of last year, um, weighing at about 265, still about 20 pounds less than my heaviest weight at 285 pounds, and I'm <clears throat> five nine and a half on a good day. I'm like five nine and a quarter. As I get older, I'm getting shorter, which is fantastic. All right. But I, I just, I've had moments of victory and moments where I just, the wheels fall off the bus and I'm back in the pantry grabbing the peanut butter. I'm eating my feelings. I'm eating my emotions. And I told you that there was this amazing baby that God has brought into our life, Olivia, um, a family member with some serious struggles, asked us to take care of her baby. And so Nicole and I made a huge decision that's the beginning of this year to do this. And I want you to know um, that I have been walking in my greatest season of victory for my health that I've ever walked through in my life. And I attribute it to this one thing that God's put on my heart. All those years I tried to lose weight, and those years when I, even when I was in shape, it was all about me. It was all about how I looked. It was all about um, how I felt about myself. It's, it's not all bad. But my vision for being in shape wasn't bigger than me. And so when I realized that our beautiful little Olivia will be, when she's 18 years old, I will be 70 years old. On January the 2nd, when I knew that she was gonna be coming into our home, 
the Lord put on my heart deeply, okay, Dan, you've got this goal again this year to lose weight. This is your, your passion. It's what you want to do. Why? Why do you want to lose weight? And for the first time in my life, my motive was bigger than me. I want to be in shape for Olivia. If God calls us to raise her for the rest of her life, rest of our lives, um, then I need to be in shape. And so once that clicked in my spirit, once the vision and the motive was bigger than me, I'm telling you, friends, I've gone from 265. Today, as I shared this message with you, I'm at 215 pounds. I got about 15 more pounds to lose. And I'm going to tell you, I've had seasons where I've lost a little bit of weight here and there. It's always been a struggle. This time around, there's a grace to it. There's a lift to it. I can't explain it. And I think it's because the vision is bigger than me. The motive is bigger than me. It's not just about how I look. It's not just about me. It's I want to be strong for Olivia. I want to be strong for our three children, Josh, Luke, and Abigail. I want to be strong for my family. I want to be strong to carry the gospel, this message that God has given me. I want to be healthy for others, not just for me. Your motive has to be bigger than just you. It makes all the difference. Yeah, I want to take a moment right now and I'm going to show you a quick video of our beautiful little Olivia. We're kinship guardians, so we're able to show these pictures now. And, uh, but here's a, here's a quick video of our little girl and kind of what's been happening in our home. Check this out. This is how Olivia is training her. She's very upset. Not good. You think she's got real problems. And then... It's a miracle. <laughs> everything's, everything's fine. It's just Aww. she's training us to hold her. <laughs> everything's wonderful. She's so though. happy. Oh, she's so wonderful. I know that my son Luke took that video with me the other day. It's so, so funny. She is literally training us to hold her all the time. But doggone it, she's worth it, you know? So I want to just take a moment as I end today with our online campus, with all of you out there watching. Let's take a moment of reflection. And I don't normally do it quite this way, but just if you have the ability maybe to close your eyes and kind of block out what's around you and what's going on. If you're driving, don't do that. But just um, let's just have a moment between you and God. And let me just walk you through a couple things for a second. What's your motive? Why are you dating him or her? Why are you marrying them? What's, what's your motive? What's your heart? Um, why aren't you quitting that job? Why are you taking that job? Why haven't you been able to reach out to your dad, to your mom? Why is it you said that to your wife, or to your husband this morning? Why exactly did that fight start? You knew that you were going to push a button. Why'd you push the button? What was the motive? How deep does it go? What were you trying to prove? What, what is it you haven't talked about that's really eating you up? And so you said that instead in a passive aggressive way. My friends, I could go on and on with this. I wanna encourage you to take some time, maybe as soon as this message is over, maybe turn off everything and take some quiet time with the Lord and just Bring up some key areas of your life, some, maybe some areas where you're struggling. Maybe it, for you it's with food. Maybe it's with exercise and getting healthy. What's your motive? Maybe it's time to ask the Holy Spirit to give you a new motive. Maybe it's a motive that needs to be bigger than you. I would really suggest that, coming like Jesus for the sake of others. And as some of you listening today, your first step isn't just to examine your heart. Your first step actually needs to start here. Maybe for some of you, for the first time in your life, you need to say, Jesus, lead my life. And we, we love the fact that there's people watching today that have never asked Christ to follow, and never asked Jesus to lead their life. They've never made that decision to follow Jesus. We love the fact that you're listening today. And maybe for some of you, it's not a first time decision. Maybe for some of you, it's a rededication of your life to Jesus. And you've been kind of doing your own thing, going your own way, and here you are today. Thank you for joining us. And maybe for some of you right now, you need to pray this with me and invite Jesus to lead your life. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. So if that's you today and you need to make that decision to follow Christ, would you pray this with you right now in your heart? God hears you. Just say this, Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. I trust you with my life. 
Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You know what it is. Thank you for your forgiveness. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love and your peace and your joy. Say it this way. Fill me with your light that will expose the motives of my heart and bring me not only into a good place with you, Jesus, but that it'll also be a good place for me. I can find the peace I long for. Just tell him that, the joy I long for, that eludes me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision today, we would love to hear from you. We have some resources we would love to help you take some next steps in your relationship with Christ. Please let us know you made that decision today. So we're just gonna push pause on this series. Next week, we're gonna come back and talk about right things. We talked about right reasons today. Next week is about integrity. It's gonna be so intense. But we're gonna talk about doing the right things. See you next week. Living a life without regrets. I hope that today you're leaving with some first steps to regret less in the future and maybe process through some of the regrets you may have had in your life. One thing I do know about regrets though is this, is that every time I've had the opportunity to think of others as more important than myself, I've usually had way fewer regrets. And last weekend, we I got to go up with our missions team to love families on the Navajo reservation. I got to capture some of that footage. Check this out. Hey, Pure Heart family, Pastor Bob here. We're up on the Navajo Nation this weekend with a team of 80 volunteers. We brought up three 26-foot truckloads of supplies of food, much-needed water and household supplies. We're putting bunk beds together and delivering them to families of kids who are sleeping on the floor, some of them on dirt floors. We're getting them a new bed, new mattress, new sheets, new blanket, new pillow, and a stuffed animal. Salad and Go is up here. We're delivering over 1,500 fresh made chicken salads. We have shoes, socks, and underwear over at the school where we're supplying all of that for over 130 kids, brand new shoes, brand new socks, brand new underwear and bras. We've got adult shoes, about 500 pairs of adult shoes for folks that need that. It's an amazing day. We wanna say thank you, Pure Heart family. It's because of your support, your contributions, your prayers that we're able to do this kind of stuff. So thank you, God bless you. So good, right? When I was up there and getting to film people and talk to them, I heard from several of the families about the difference that things like a bed, food, water, shoes are gonna make in their life. Things that I take and many of us take so for granted. Getting to show the others the love of Christ, I, I find that that's a pretty hard place to have regrets when I go do that. I was so blessed to be there. I just also wanna say a big thank you to all those who you who give. Your faithfulness and your generosity is what allows Pure Heart to continue to connect with people all over the world and show them the love of Christ just like what happened on that Navajo Nation trip. And if you're looking to begin supporting the continued mission of Pure Heart, you go, this is something I wanna get behind. Giving can be done through the pureheart.org slash give or in the Pure Heart app. And lastly, share the service with someone in your life so they can stay connected through all three weeks, especially if you know that they've been struggling with regret. By sharing the service, you're being a part of lives being reached and people finding freedom in their life. So with that in mind, be blessed and we will see you next week.